the terrorist attacks against uh, the West with Islamic background surprised the public, especially those who share the conviction that better form of common living cannot be imagined as, and realized as democracy. The self-image of these societies is that, is that they are founded on universal human principles and consequently they are the most inclusive societies ever. Respect, religious freedom, freedom of consciousness and of communication, human rights are some of the fundamental values of it. Neither the founder nor later citizens could imagine that those values are such that they are their practical, they or their practical consequences could lead people to attack those societies. It will be the task of future generations and of ours, of course, to answer the question, how would be possible those attacks? What are the causes of them? And how to ensure peace, how to appease, how to pacificate those people who attack now democracies? Of course, we have heard several times about peace, but we cannot realize peace without justice. Uh, this is a very important thing. I will return to this. Is the possible appeasement a question of religious or cultural education? What does it mean, religion and culture, in and for the democratic societies? First, I would like to uh, make a precision, uh, religion and culture. Religion is, of course, not the same as culture. They are generative and constituent part of every society, where religion seems to play the great eminence behind culture. Religion is very often resource of values, of motivations which develop the whole culture, together with many other components, such as language, historical circumstances, climate, literature, genius individuals. Although different, they depend on each other, vice versa. I understand that culture is a larger concept as religion, but cultures are largely determined by their relationship to religions. In the past, traditional cultures were mostly mono-religious, but later the differentiations and the conflicts led in the 18th century to the realization that peaceful modern societies cannot be grounded on religion. As human beings became the highest value in modern culture, then it became obsolete to ground societies on religion and not on humans. If we found them on human beings, then we have to respect first its freedom to choose in general and to choose his religion specially. This leads to multi-religions in or multi-religious societies. Religions are, per definition, intolerant. All religions understand as themselves as God's revelation. If God is one, he can give only one revelation of himself, and there can be only one true religion. This true religion should defend the truth and eliminate all other religions which defend their truth. If constitutional politics and culture gives a role on the stage or in the backstage to religions, there will be a continuous fight for the interpretation of the world, of history, of culture, of revelation. If a society should be constructed for peaceful uh, common life of the people, religion should not have any official and legal place in politics. To avoid the war of religions, religion must be eliminated from the public sphere, it must be eliminated from public discussions, it must be eliminated from the foundation of a democratic state. The separation of religion and churches from the state is one of the most important steps in the development of modern democracy, and this step was made first by uh, the Americans and by French uh, uh, Revolution. To give some arguments to my propositions, I would like uh, uh, to make some propositions. I emphasize three points. First point, you can read on your handout and uh, also here. Religious freedom of the West is a result of a, of a long development. 
I evoke this with the example of Thomas Jefferson's ideas. We have to study the history of freedom to develop strategies against religious aggressivity and to integrate religious groups not yet democratized. The way will lead us through more education understood as developing the capability of individual reasoning and thinking. Second, martial and intolerant elements in Islam uh, should be appeased and how it can be done, whether it can be done at all. My third point, democracy should be grounded on reason. What is reason? What kind of reason is understood here? Reason is always, always public. The reason of all human beings have the same structure and the same laws. The laws of reason are the laws of democracy. I don't think that I can really explain all this. Uh, this uh, would be my main points if I would have two hours to speak. And the fourth point is the solution thick and thin. Um, first, I speak uh, 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 some words about uh, Thomas Jefferson and about religious freedom. Uh, this is the fundament of uh, these ideas what I uh, will uh, uh, invoke now are the fundament of our uh, democratic uh, self-understanding. One of the founder of the first modern democracy, Thomas Jefferson, a combatant of religious freedom said, why should I care what religion my neighbor has as long as he does not coerce me to believe the same? He over and over again emphasized educated reason in the fundamental instance of common life. In a note, he writes the famous formula, quoted many times as the foundation, foundational idea of free society. You can read. The rise of conscience we never submitted, we could not submit. We are answerable for them to our God. The legitimate powers of government extend to such acts only as are injurious to others. But it does me no injury for my neighbor to say there are 20 gods or no god. It neither picks my pocket nor breaks my leg. Reason and free inquiry are the only effectual agents, agents against error. Of course, here's one difference. Uh, now we have a religion which wants to break my leg. So we have now uh, enlarged this idea and discussed how uh, we can go further. So the last phrase, reason and free inquiry are the only effectual ag agents ag against error and against terror. Jefferson was a learner through his life and discovered education and learning that education and learning are the best ways for create and emerge a public, nature for a peaceful and civilized common life. The way to religious freedom was long. In Virginia, Anglicans persecuted other religions that forced Quakers to return to England. In New England, Presbyterians persecuted Anglicans and all other religions. What Jefferson writes in 17th chapter of his notes on the state of Virginia shows that until the end of the 18th century, uh, religious persecution and compulsion among different Christian churches was on the East Coast an everyday business. Free inquiry and reason are presuppositions of free society. Truth can stand by itself, means Jefferson, it does not need to support of any religious group. About religious truths, we cannot have disputes, he says, because we do not have empirical evidence of the facts grounding religious beliefs. On the other hand, democracy can flourish, flourish only in a society where reasonable and free discussions can take place. Since the truth of religions, religious ideas cannot be proved, they should be abandoned from public discussions. Jefferson refers to the experience of some young American states, such as New York. Quotation. They made the happy discovery that the way to silence religious disputes is to take no notice of them. They could do that, but how, what can we do now in our today's situation? Discussion, free disputes are the cement of democracy. 
Religion itself is, as Rorty puts it, conversation stopper. If there is no conversation, there is no democracy and social peace. If a religion or a religious group does not accept other religions, does not accept religious freedom, it has no place in modern democracy. If it tries to destroy the democratic and free structures, democracy should defend itself. Religious believers should uh, trade, quotation, privatization for a guarantee of religious liberty. Rorty gives key to this Richard Rorty, the, perhaps one of the greatest American philosopher of 20th century neo-pragmatist. Uh, I quote him again. The main reason religion needs to be privatized is that in political discussion with those outside the relevant religious community, it is a conversation stopper. If someone refers to his political engagement as the representation of God's will or the teaching of his church, then he stops the further discussion with people who do not believe in the same church, who do not believe to the same community. And now I, uh, this was the first par West. Now I speak uh, about Islam. I just gave you a short background uh, of uh, religious freedom and freedom in the modern democracy. And behind this background, we have to see wha what kind of religion is Islam. I am not an Islamist, so I must uh, lean on, uh, in German, living Islamic scientist, Hamad Abdel Samad. He's the so son of a Sunni uh, priest in Egypt. And he left uh, Egypt, went, uh, by me, eight minutes, excuse me. Okay, he left, uh, uh, he left uh, uh, Egypt and is living in Germany under uh, police uh, defense. Uh, he just published the book, uh, Mohammed eine Abrechnung, it is uh, actually only in German. He goes to the sources of, uh, uh, of his religion and uh, uh, he says to understand uh, uh, Mohammedanism or uh, Muslims, we have to understand the sources, what kind of person was Mohammed. He says, as we have to understand, Christians we can understand only if we understand what kind of person was Jesus or the act of apostle. To understand what, who are the communists, we have to look what Bolshevists have done. Uh, he writes, Mohammed was, Mohammed was an orphan and a case for psychologists. He had a double personality. In Mecca, he preached goodness, commiseration, forgiveness. In Medina, he revealed itself as a psychiatric case, despot, and mass murder. He violated quasi, he violated quasi systematically moral norms of his time. His acts resulted in revulsions of the society. He married first a rich woman with whom he lived until he was 40 years old. After it, he went to the desert, mediated in caves, and said the stones are speaking to him. Later, he thought on suicide and referred to the revelation of God. The second uh, was, the second uh, wave of him was uh, the resettlement from Mecca to Medina, where he founded the first Islamic state. Here he killed lots of people. He himself organized great conquering campaigns, efficient even today. Despot in the state, childish and jealous toward women. He prescribed the beclouding of them. In the last eight years of his life, he participated in 80 wars. The end of Quran, Quran is about the deification of war and the imprecation of the faithlessness. On, of the faithless. The warrior's compensation is richness on the earth and beyond with a slave army of beautiful women. The most important income war is war plunder slavery market. Quotation, the Quran contains at least 109 verses, uh, you can read it, 109 verses that call Muslims to war uh, with non-believers for the sake of Islamic rule. Some are quite graphic, with comments to chop off heads and fingers and kill infidels wherever they may be hiding. Muslims who do not join the fight are called hypocrites and warn that Allah will send them to hell if they do not join the slaughter. 
And uh, I think killing uh, to, to be, to have uh, the text in a, in a holy text that you should kill the non-believers uh, can, can be everything but not a universal religion because uh, uh, if you are not the member of it, uh, you have to be killed. This is self-contradiction. I have on the paper several, um, uh, several other quotations for other Muslim scientists. You can read what they are writing about the, the aggressive and terroristic origin of is Islam, and they say they don't believe, Islamic scientists who left the Islam, they don't believe that there is a peaceful version of Islam. And this is the great problem. If we say there are these friendly uh, and... Uh, and uh, uh, friendly imams everywhere in the West, but isn't, aren't the, the Muslim uh, communities not time bombs which can explode every time? I ask uh, this, I don't have now uh, the time to explain all this. I go to the third part of my lecture very shortly. I think that Immanuel Kant discovered not not constructed. There's a question in philosophy whether we construct or whether we discover uh, truth. I think this is a discovery. Kant, uh, and he thought, Immanuel Kant himself, that he discovered it, the categorical imperative, the universal moral law uh, in one phrase, you can say it here, act on according to that maxim whereby you can at the same time will uh, that it should be became a universal law without contradiction. This is reformulated in 20th century by John Rawls in Theory of Justice, a Harvard professor. And I think that we have, and I argue for that, and I would argue for it in more details, uh, we have a universal ethics. This universal ethic is that um, uh, written in this one phrase in the categorical imperative, uh, everyone should have in the life the same chance. Every human being should have respect, freedom to create himself, to, to build up his life. And if there is a religion which doesn't ensure this, it cannot be the true religion. It cannot be a truthful religion. If there is terror or aggressivity in the core, in the writing of a religion, it cannot be uh, the uh, true religion. And of course, Immanuel Kant wrote a beautiful book, not very much uh, loved by theologians, uh, Christian theologians. It's the uh, religion within the bounds of sheer reason. And here he says the moral religion whose authentication rests upon a certificate which is retained in each soul and cannot be eradicated and which has no need of uh, miracles and no need especially of historical uh, stories, as he writes. So uh, uh, I think that it can be proved with the help of some Western uh, scholars, among them Kant, but I could quote uh, several others, that uh, we cannot go behind universal love, universal respect, universal freedom, and Ju we have just in uh, in uh, uh, Quran uh, a very very dangerous uh, religion. If we can uh, believe uh, to to those uh, uh, not scientists, to those theologians, uh, Islamic and Mohammedan theologians who left uh, their religion and. Uh, uh, write us about their experience. And the last phrase, uh, Michael Ward, uh, uh, an American professor, wrote a book, Thick and Thin, and he told there is a thick and a thin morality. The thin morality is what we can describe in, uh, in laws which are valid for every person in the world. The, th the law of justice, the law of respect, the law of freedom, you have to decide for your life, etc. And uh, thick is what you are doing with your life, how, how, what kind of community you, you, you would like to be. You would like to be a Hungarian, a German, an American, an Englishman, and so on. This is the thickness of your morality, how you live your uh, thin morality. But we have a thin morality, and this is universal. The universal respect for every person, it is uh, uh, described in a very nice book, Thick and Thin. I, uh, recommends to you. Uh, 
I am sorry that I couldn't, be more, uh, couldn't go more in detail. Thank you very much for your attention. Now, I want to ask in my talk, does Europe have a future? Europe is a continent and an idea with an alternately heroic and ignominious past and with what seemed until recently to be an enviable present. But does it have a future? The November the 13th terrorist attacks in Paris mark the culmination so far of a concerted campaign directed mainly at Europeans and orchestrated or inspired first by Al-Qaeda, that was Madrid, uh, 2004, London 2005, more recently by the self-proclaimed caliphate based in the Islamic State of Syria and Iraq. The latest round of carnage began with the 2014 attack on the Jewish Museum in Brussels, was stepped up in January of this past year with the Charlie Hebdo and kosher supermarket massacres in Paris, continued with shootings at a free speech gathering in Copenhagen, mass assaults on European tourists in Tunisia, followed by explosions in Ankara and Beirut, reaching a crescendo with the multiple attacks in Paris. So Europeans are now faced with questions they have hitherto preferred to dodge. Are Europeans ready to fight for Europe? What is the place of Islam in a post-Christian Europe? Or to look at it from the jihadist point of view, what is the place of Europe in a fast expanding and globalized Islam? Is 21st century Europe still the heart of Western civilization or is it changing out of all recognition? However one answers these questions, a brave new world seems to be emerging in which Europe becomes the theater where the clash of civilizations is played out. So far, the signs are that this encounter will be no more peaceful than it has been in the Middle East. Since the origins of what we now call Western civilization in Athens, Rome, and Jerusalem, the patrimony of the ancient world, as embodied particularly in the realms of philosophy, law, and the Jewish and Christian scriptures, has continued to inspire the nations to the north of the Mediterranean. Without that legacy, the West's political, economic, and intellectual success and dominance could never have been achieved. Standing on the shoulders of the, their ancient giants, Europeans created the world we now live in through a long series of intellectual revolutions, each one intended to secure a particular kind of liberty. In the medieval era, it was the libertas ecclesiae, the freedom of the church from the state. In the Renaissance, it was the liberty of the emerging individual. In the Reformation and Counter-Reformation, at stake was liberty of conscience, while in the scientific revolution, it was freedom of the mind. Both were made possible by the freedom of the press. In the Enlightenment, people aspired to personal and ultimately political freedom under the law, regardless of race, religion, or class. In the Industrial Revolution, economic liberty made possible a general rise in prosperity that for the first time in history lifted the majority of Europeans out of poverty, gave them access to education and the fruits of civilization. Finally, in the last century, we have witnessed an era in which all the previous upheavals combined to produce not so much a revolution as literally and metaphorically an explosion of modernity that has rendered all previous assumptions obsolete. But the consummation of this long process of emancipation has paradoxically called into question some of our most hard-won liberties. Humanity has bifurcated into the free world where private and public liberties are protected by the rule of law and in reaction against that realm of freedom, the dominion of despotism a succession of tyrannies that seek to deny individual freedom and instead seek salvation in submission to the absolute authority of a totalizing ideology. From the political religions of communism, fascism, and Nazism with their personality cults to the religious politics of Islamism with its own personality cults, we are now living through a period of unprecedented polarization between Western civilization and its enemies. At just this moment, to complicate the picture, the West, and Europe in particular, has largely abandoned its patrimony. Philosophy no longer offers a defense of Western values against the insidious onslaught of despotism from without and nihilism from within. Law, detached from its moorings in the divinely ordained order of nature, is now seen as the embodiment of human rights of any and all kinds, themselves deduced from a liberal politics that rejects any foundation in biblical morality. The hurricane of relativism has swept all before it, breaking, bending to breaking point 
the mighty tree of Western civilization, hollowed out by self-hatred and weakened by the loss of its religious roots. Pride of place among those religious roots is the Hebraic idea of freedom under the law, not the only bequest to Europe made by ancient Israel, but one that has borne fruit right up to the present day. Yet Europe has a bad case of amnesia when it comes to the specifically Jewish contribution to Western civilization. The Hebrew Bible, once the most familiar book in Europe, now languishes unread. Beginning in the Enlightenment, the secular turn taken by Jewish and non-Jewish thinkers under the influence of Benedict Spinoza and Moses Mendelssohn yielded untold riches for every branch of science, the humanities, and the arts. But anti-Judaism also took a secular turn, mutating first into a political and racial anti-Semitism that culminated genocidally in the Shoah and now, in its most recent camouflage, into anti-Zionism. Europe, once as eager to appropriate the Jewish past as it had been to reject the Jews who were its carriers, now averts its eyes from the Jewish future. The post-Shoah diminution of the Jewish presence and spirit in European civilization led in the fullness of time to the diminution of Christianity as well. Since 1945, the established Protestant churches have fallen into dis disuetude. A, a generation later, the Catholic Church is now also in long-term decline. The eclipse of Christian Europe, bringing with it the eclipse of the God of Abraham and Isaac, thereby casts the whole history of liberty into shadow. The horizon of European thought has shrunk as the grand tradition that stretches from the ancient Orient to the modern Occident narrows into a fixation on the immediate and the ephemeral. The God of Israel remains hidden and elusive even as he is denied and denounced by an atheist culture that does not even know who or what it is denying or denouncing. Up to this point, I've been considering Europe in general and from the perspective of the distant past, yet considered in its present form as a geographical continent, as a cultural idea, or as the political entity that calls itself the European Union, Europe is, or certainly should be, all about particularity. However much unreconstructed Europhiles may protest that nation states are irrelevant, in fact, Europe can exist only as what Charles de Gaulle called l'Europe des patries, the Europe of nations. Indeed, the influence of the European nation state, of the European tradition of national patriotism, is still to be felt all over the world, not least in Israel. Zionism, though very much a uniquely impassioned cry of the dispossessed, stands firmly in that European tradition. Indeed, it is precisely for this reason that Zionism, as the animating idea of the Jewish state, meets today with such ill-disguised distaste, or worse, in the Europe of the secular Europhiles. For to many of your, today's Europeans, nationalism is their continent's original sin. Their American counterparts say the same thing about their own country. According to the most sacred tenets of the secular religion of Europe, Nationalism today is what, for, um, is what for John Milton in Paradise Lost was, I quote, the fruit of that forbidden tree whose mortal taste brought death into the world and all our woe, unquote. A cluster of large-scale histories of Europe have appeared in recent years by such distinguished authors as Conrad Jarausch, Brendan Sims, Heinrich August Winkler, and Ian Kershaw. All of them accept without question the post-war consensus that, first, the European catastrophes of the last century were caused primarily by the nationalist disease, to which, second, the only antidote is pan-European unity, fostered through centralized institutions created with that explicit aim. Yet both of these propositions are demonstrably false. Fascism, National Socialism, and Communism were all supranational ideologies, even global ideologies, Lenin and Stalin saw the class war as transcending boundaries of state or nation, just as Hitler thought race a much more fundamental factor than nation. Nor has pan-European ideology proved successful in preventing the re-emergence of extreme nationalist ideologies of left and right. To the contrary, the imposition of that ideology on the Europe of nations has provoked that re-emergence. And the same goes for the re-emergence of anti-Semitism, on the rise not only in the so-called New Europe to the East, but also in the supposedly cured countries of Western Europe. 
According to a recent study by the University of Bielefeld, around 40% of people in most European countries believe that Israel is conducting a, quote, war of extermination, unquote, against the Palestinians. In Germany, of all places, the figure rises to 48%. As many as 70% of Hungarians, 50% of Poles, and 20% of Germans also agree with the statement that Jews have too much influence. Even in some of the very countries where the Shoah took place, and where today only a tiny number of Jews remain, very large proportions of the population hold classical anti-Semitic views. The recrudescence of such attitudes becomes politically dangerous when extremist parties or demagogues can find a legitimate grievance on which to campaign. And in providing such legitimate grievances, the EU, a failure in so many ways, has proved dismally successful. Hitherto, much of Europe has luxuriated in what the French call embourgeoisement and the English call gentrification, a safety-first society where the only real issue is that there are no real issues, and the only question is why nobody ever questions anything. The consequences of this, not just for the health, but for the very safety of European societies, are nowhere so evident as in the showcase nation of Germany. Germany is a safety-first society par excellence. Curiously enough, the one thing it refuses to spend money on is security. United Germany devotes about the same resources to defence today as did West Germany, with an economy a third of its size, in 1975. And that wasn't very much, even in those days. Well, perhaps it's not so curious after all. Until recently, Germans must have thought themselves very safe indeed. Not for nothing is Chancellor Angela Merkel affectionately referred to as Mutti, Mum. When she made her grand gesture last summer, declaring that her country's door was open to the refugees from Syria, an enthusiastic columnist at the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, Germany's venerable paper of record, went so far as to proclaim that she was now the mother of Europe. It is doubtful that Mrs. Merkel aspires to be a secular Blessed Virgin Mary. More likely, she would happily settle for the Nobel Peace Prize. Indeed, she has recently been fated as Time Magazine's Person of the Year, perhaps to contrast her with the runner-up, the self-proclaimed Caliph al-Baghdadi. Time dubbed her Chancellor of the Free World. I noticed that just a day or two ago, the Financial Times followed suit. She's FT Person of the Year, too. In fact, however, she is now a lonely figure. Even her physicist husband, Joachim Sauer, confided recently to German students in Oxford that he has doubts about his wife's open-door migration policy. One of these students told me that. As for the German public, it was never convinced by this grandstanding overture on the part of a previously cautious and pragmatic leader normally inclined to follow rather than to get ahead of public, opi public opinion. It has now turned decisively against the Chancellor. Slowly but surely, it is dawning on Germans that they have embarked on a social and demographic experiment that will have very long-term consequences indeed. In 2014, even before the present migration crisis, Germany had already absorbed well over a million immigrants of all kinds, more than the United States, which has four times the population and is heir to a very different history of immigration. Official German figures for 2015 suggest that the total number, number of immigrants for, for this year will be substantially higher than for the previous year, and next year higher still. Now, within that total, the overwhelming majority will be Muslims, including those from Syria and other war-torn war regions. Integrating non-Germans on this scale is a challenge of an entirely new order. Wir schaffen das! says Mrs. Merkel, roughly, yes, we can. But studies suggest that Germany has been by some distance the least successful society in Western Europe at integrating its immigrants. German law was only recently reformed to allow the naturalization of non-Germans. Even then, it required resident aliens to adopt an undefined German way of life as a condition of citizenship. Five years ago, Mrs. Merkel herself said of the previous policy, based on a let a thousand flowers bloom multiculturalism, that, quote, this approach has failed, utterly failed. 
unquote. Needless to say, many Muslims have refused to obey the requirement to have a German way of life as contrary to Islamic rulings. And now, instead of remaining resident aliens, they can get citizenship anyway. So now that millions of Muslims, most of them young men, are settling in German cities, it is easy to see that politicians who reject the governing coalition of Christian Democrats and Social Democrats have at hand, uh, have the issue they have always lacked, ge a genuine grievance. New parties with charismatic leaders can exploit the coming backlash against Mrs. Merkel, and they may not come from the far right, but from the liberal educated middle class that sees its cherished freedoms sort of freedoms that the professor was talking about, Immanuel Kant and all that stuff, uh, at risk from radical Islam. The resultant turmoil has rolled intra-party, has, has roiled, uh, uh, sorry, intra-party as well as inter-party politics. And this has already happened in one of Germany's European neighbors. Soon after 9-11, Dutch politics was galvanized by the brief career of Pim for Time a gay Catholic politician of the left who, describing Islam as a backward religion, drawing a sharp contrast between liberal Holland and Muslim rule countries, called for an end to Muslim immigration. So, does that ring any bells? I mean, have we been hearing a bit about that in this country um, and, and even in America? Anyway, this is what Fortuyn had to say uh, back in 2002. Quote, in what country could the leader of a large political movement as mine be openly homosexual. How wonderful that that's possible. That's something one could be proud of, and I'd like to keep it that way, thank you very much." Unquote. So in the run-up to the 2002 Dutch election, in which he was leading the opinion polls, Pim Fortuyn was assassinated by a fellow Dutchman who was also ostensibly of the left. In confessing to the crime, the killer claimed to have been defending Muslims from persecution and likened Fortuyn to Hitler. Released on parole last year, by the way, this man, he has never expressed remorse for his crime. In Germany, the social democratic politician, another man of the left, and writer, Thilo Zarazin, achieved similar notoriety merely for publishing a politically incorrect book, Deutschland schafft sich ab, Germany abolishes itself, a 2010 bestseller that led to his dismissal from the board of the German Central Bank and to the curtailing of his political political career. Five years later, many Germans now see his dire predictions being fulfilled in the open-door policy of Angela Merkel. At a recent lecture in Oxford by Timothy Garton Ash, who strongly defended the Chancellor's actions, I suggested a parallel between the blunder by the East German official Gunter Schabowski that in 1989 opened the Berlin Wall and led to the collapse of communism and Mrs. Merkel's decision to open Germany's borders to refugees. Now, the reason I mentioned that was that I played a small part in that incident. Uh, I was at that press conference when uh, Schabowski uh, made his remarks. I asked the last question, the only one that actually mentioned the Berlin Wall in that conference. And um, uh, if we had more time, I would even have shown you the, the uh, footage of it. It's fascinating to see what happened when Schabowski was asked what will happen to the Berlin Wall now? And he just had no answer at all. You know, he stood there frozen and appalled because they hadn't thought through the long-term consequences of opening the wall. And in both cases, the miscalculation was based on a failure to think through these consequences, to look several moves ahead. Garton Ash, who's a staunch admirer of the Chancellor, naturally rejected my comparison as deeply insulting. Um, but even he admitted that she might well have overreached. Now, I've focused on Germany because, for obvious historical reasons, it poses a unique political risk. Unlike neighboring countries, like Austria and, I'm afraid, Hungary too, the taboo on far-right politics in Germany has lasted for three generations. And there is no German Jobbik at the moment, uh, let alone the uh, free... Uh, um, the Freedom Party, uh, there is Pegida, but it's much, much smaller. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, no, the AFD is not really a, a far-right party. But, um, but, the, uh, um, uh, but anyway, what my point is that it is changing now. Germany is changing. 
um, just as the Holocaust is moving beyond living memory, the nation's long-term stability has suddenly been thrown into doubt. Still, for anyone seeking to grasp the de demographic implications of Islamic immigration into Europe, the British example may be even more illuminating. Between 2001 and 2011, census figures show an exponential growth in the proportion of Muslims in some British cities. In Manchester, for example, by as much as 122%. That's in 10 years. And it's grown a great deal more since 2011, the last census. The growth is even more dramatic when we consider the youngest cohort. In 2011, for example, 35% of children under 15 in Birmingham, the UK's second largest city, were Muslim. And that figure can be assumed to have risen much higher since then. So in brief, the Islamization of Europe is not a myth or a figment peddled by the far right, but will soon become a reality in many European cities, if it isn't already. So it is against this background that the present migration crisis takes on an ominous significance. Just as the practice of European Christianity seems to be falling off a demographic and spiritual cliff, Islam is advancing by leaps and bounds. It is not only a matter of mass migration and high birth rates, increasingly it will also be a matter of mass cultural, religious and political influence, conversion. That is what happened in the Middle East after a certain point, you know, a huge number of non-Muslims just gave up and converted. So should Europeans acquiesce in this Islamization of their continent? Or should they rather be attempting something far more ambitious and therefore much riskier, namely the Europeanization of Islam? This is not the same as the once prevalent doctrine of multiculturalism. Indeed, it is roughly its opposite. It is clear that a sizable proportion of Muslims who've grown up in Europe are already assimilated in their values. In their civic lives, they've made a choice to be Europeans first and Muslims second. That is to say, they've chosen democracy over theocracy. They have done so sometimes in the teeth of hostility from families and communities. They have proved that it is possible, even if not yet easy, for Muslims to be just as Western as non-Muslims. This is the first step, but the Europeanization of Muslims is not the same as the Europeanization of Islam. The theology, the legal system, the political theory of Islam have remained largely immune to Western influences thus far. It remains for European Muslims to make up their minds to be the vanguard of an Islamic enlightenment that might just happen. That would mean an Islam minus jihad, minus elements of Sharia, minus polygamy, an Islam that treated women not as chattels but as the equals of men, that no longer turned a blind eye to forced marriage, genital mutilation and slavery, that rejected the politics of Islamism and accepted the separation of mosque and state, that was no longer all about submission, but also about freedom. Such an Islam already exists and is practiced by millions of adherents to some, but not the largest, of its traditions, particularly the Sufi, the Ahmadiyya, and the Ismaili. But the religious authorities of the two main traditions, the Sunni and the Shiite, not to mention the more stringent teaching of the Wahhabi and the Salafi, reject such ideas as incompatible with Islam itself. So an Islamic reformation, res renaissance, and enlightenment won't happen in Europe, let alone in the Muslim heartlands, if Europe abandons any belief in its own identity. The collapse of civilizational morale, analyzed by such thinkers as George Weigel, Christopher Caldwell, Alain Finkelkraut, and others, does not exactly make Europe an attractive role model. Islamists promote their intolerant, triumphalist, aggressive interpretation of Islam, in part by contrasting it with European decadence. Faced with such a choice, is it any surprise that many young Muslims become Islamists, and more than a few of them, jihadists? If, as is now inevitable, Muslims are to make up a large and growing proportion of the population of Europe, the, the, the survival of Europe as we know it will depend on whether the Europeanization of Islam takes place before the Islamization of Europe. It is a race against time. I think I'll have to stop there because I've run out of time. Thank you.
I'm not an academic or a politician, which may mean precarious things career-wise, but it means at least I don't have to ever be politically correct, and I um, hope I won't be today. I'm going to take my, um, my text from Alice in Wonderland, which is one of the best texts to understand what's happening in Europe at the moment. And you'll all remember uh, the conversation between Alice and the White Queen, when the White Queen uh, tries to urge Alice to practice uh, thinking of impossible things. And Alice says, one can't think of impossible things. And the White Queen says, nonsense. When I was your age, I used to spend at least half an hour a morning thinking impossible things. Why, I used to be able to think of at least six impossible things before breakfast. Well, Europeans are expected to think far more than six impossible things before breakfast these days, and I could be here all day if I wanted to list all of the impossible things that you and I are expected to believe. But let me just go over four of the impossible things which we're meant to believe, and I'll do them as briefly as I can. The first of the impossible things which we're asked to believe is that Islam is a peaceful religion. It's very evidently not. Uh, no, religion is entirely peaceful, but Islam, Islam is especially not peaceful. We are, of course, always reminded that there is a problem of authority within Islam, and that is certainly true. But it also means that the sources matter, matter even more than those of any other religion, because it means that the source is what you have to go on. It means that the source will most likely always trump any organization or any individual who claims to speak for the religion more than the sources. That's why, as the professor said at the beginning, the life of Muhammad is so important if one is going to understand this. And as the professor said, um, when Muhammad was uh, weak, he was more generous. When he was strong, that generosity uh, palpably, visibly uh, declined somewhat. And we see a similar thing in the world today, and we see a similar thing, I would argue, not only in Islamic societies, but within Islamic communities in European societies. When Islam is in a minority, it speaks a very great deal about minority rights. We cannot help noticing that when Islam is in a majority, or at least in a position to rule, those minority rights go out of the window. Minority rights of sexual minorities, the minority rights of religious minorities, and so on. The problem, which uh, this boils down to, I'll be as brief as possible on it, is that uh, Europeans uh, cannot accept uh, the fact that uh, what ISIS and other terrorists do is very obviously the worst possible interpretation of Islam. It is obviously the worst possible interpretation of Islam for Muslims worldwide, and it is obviously the very worst version of Islam possible for non-Muslims worldwide. Nevertheless, it is a plausible interpretation of the texts in front of them and the tradition from which they come. And if you doubt that, I would, um, would urge you to consider one uh, particular source, which if there is an authority within the Muslim world, you might turn to, and that is the University of Al-Azhar in Cairo. And I'm very sorry that both the Egyptian ambassador and also our friend from the Fatwa uh, Council uh, are absent now. Um, but if you look at what happened uh, last uh, December, um, a year ago, and a young Jordanian pilot shot down over ISIS-controlled territory. And you'll remember that he was burned alive brutally by the uh, maniacs of ISIS. Uh, that young man was a Muslim himself, uh, and the people of ISIS claimed to be acting uh, in the name of Islam as well. Al-Azhar in Cairo had an extraordinary debate about this, uh, one aspect of which was this, that the, um, uh, the, the, the senior clerics said that what had happened uh, should be punished, that the people who did that and burned that brave young Muslim Jordanian pilot should be punished. They should be punished, incidentally, by either being crucified or by having alternate legs and arms cut off. This was because they had broken the Islamic prohibition on the desecration of a body. You might think that crucifixion somewhat broke that prohibition as well. Um, but uh, they also said, very strikingly, that the thing to bear in mind about ISIS was that they were indeed terrorists, they were indeed extremists, but, quote, not to be described as heretics. Um, just a couple of days ago, one of uh, very distinguished scholars, uh, graduates of Al-Azhar, Sheikh Mohammed Abdullah Nasra, uh, gave a televised interview in which he was asked uh, why Al-Azhar is uh, in the habit of denouncing secular thinkers as un-Islamic, but uh, refuses to denounce the Islamic state as un-Islamic. 
And Sheikh Nasr said, quote, uh, it, it can't, it, uh, Al-Azhar, can't condemn the Islamic State as un-Islamic. The Islamic State is a byproduct of Al-Azhar's programs. So how can Al-Azhar denounce itself as un-Islamic? This, I simply present it, as, is a very significant problem. Nevertheless, we are invited to believe the impossible and to believe every day before breakfast uh, that Islam is a religion of peace and that there's uh, nothing else to see. The second thing we're invited to believe that is obviously impossible is that multiculturalism works. Now, it's a very striking thing that five years ago, as Daniel Johnson referred to, Angela Merkel said that multiculturalism had failed. Four years ago, President Sarkozy and Prime Minister Cameron also said that multiculturalism had failed. Yet we as Europeans are invited to believe that when migration was at a relative low point, multiculturalism had failed. Whereas when migration was at such a historic high as it currently is, it could possibly work. This is a very impossible thing to believe. We're also invited to believe that the numbers don't matter, that uh, the, the quantity of people coming in would not in any way particularly affect your society. Uh, there is a figure that I uh, can't help trotting out on such occasions when I hear such things. Um, we are often told in Britain, and I know across Europe people are told, that we are all migrant societies. This is a, a not true. It is a, b a bit of casuistry we've been invited to engage in. Uh, but it is true that we have had immigration throughout our history. But if you consider that the largest migration that people still speak about in Britain over recent centuries was four centuries ago, when in 16, 1683, in the aftermath of 1683, um, more than 50,000 Huguenots, uh, French Protestants, came to the United Kingdom. Such a large migration that people still talk about it. From 1997 onwards, 50,000 immigrants was about six weeks of average immigration into the UK. So the numbers clearly do matter in some way, and they obviously matter as well because of a density question. Nobody in any of our countries has worked out what to do about, as it were, dispersing people who arrive in such large numbers. And the result in different ways in Paris, in Germany, and in England and elsewhere is you effectively get ghettos. Uh, these ghettos are, uh, have all sorts of negative things to do with them, but one which is not noted enough, I would say, but I would give one figure to you that may be relevant, is the extent to which they can cause radicalization themselves. If you go through the figures that my think tank uh, has produced uh, from every single person convicted, not, not, not suspected, but convicted of terrorism-related offenses in the UK, nine out of 10 of those people who have been convicted of Islamic terrorism offenses come from areas where the population is between 25 and 50% Muslim. That is around seven to 10 times the national average. That is not a coincidence, it is a byproduct of a, a density of population. We're also, the fourth impossible thing we're invited to believe is that the identity of immigrants into our societies does not matter. Now, in the UK, in the wake of the atrocities in January in Paris, a, a poll was conducted of British Muslims, which found that 27% of British Muslims had some sympathy with the people who had gone into the offices of Charlie Hebdo uh, and massacred uh, 10 journalists and two policemen. They had some sympathy with that. Now, when I was in Denmark a few months ago speaking at the parliament for the 10th anniversary of the Danish cartoons affair, uh, I was very struck by speaking to a Danish politician who said that she didn't want any more Muslim immigrants in Denmark. And I said, are you sure, you know, it's a somewhat, you know, somewhat clear, but uh, arguably too clear policy. She said, no, why should we? Because for every 100 immigrants we bring in, there will be at least 70 who don't believe we should publish cartoons and want to limit what we say and speak about and what we publish in our newspapers. And it's a difficult argument to refute. Um, Angela Merkel, I gather in recent days, has been in touch with the Israeli government to try to find out how the Israelis have absorbed so many people into their society so successfully in recent decades. Of course, one of the reasons why they've been able to do that is because the people coming to Israel are Jewish. It may well come as a great shock to Angela Merkel that the million people she's let into her country this year are not all German Lutherans. <laughs> but if, uh, if you believe, as most people do now, that there is at least a proportion of this community, and we must always remember only a proportion, not a majority, but a proportion of this community that is a problem. Let's go to the lowest possible proportion. Let's pretend that only 1% of that community 
uh, has any bad ideas or bad intent towards our society. Let's just pretend 1%. Nobody can tell us why 1% of, say, 2 million people is a problem, but 1% of 4 million or 5 million people is not. This is an impossible thing. So we're asked to fib ourselves. Uh, we console ourselves with, um, with lies. We have been in Europe uh, rewriting, among other things, our past. Uh, at any um, historical discussion now, anywhere in Europe, uh, there is always uh, um, uh, somebody who raises, quite often, quite a lot of people who raise, for instance, the issue of the Islamic Neoplatonists, a very interesting corner of history. But this now bears an unbelievable load historically. People argue that the Islamic Neoplatonists are what we owe our entire civilization to, that we would be in the Dark Ages if it weren't for the Islamic Neoplatonists. At a recent event at the European Parliament I was speaking at, one of the members of the European Commission waved a copy of a book called A Thousand and One Islamic Inventions. This, he doesn't know, is an act of dawah by the Muslim Brotherhood. But in any case, he waved this book, A Thousand and One Islamic Inventions, which has toured the world, went even to the Science Museum in Britain, uh, the exhibition of the book, and it's entirely fictional. But it's consoling to us. It says that uh, um, Islam invented almost everything in the world. It invented cities, it invented agriculture, it invented free thought. It even says at one point that Muhammad invented the toothbrush. I'm never quite sure why they need to throw that one in. Um, but it basically says we as our, it rewrites our societies. It rewrites our societies in, Isl in an Islamic slant so that we actually uh, 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 owe our society to Islam. Uh, this is a, a lie we tell ourselves simply in order to try to get by in the situation created for us by our politicians. We then also pretend to ourselves that our values are shared by everyone when anybody who speaks to any arrival from the Middle East uh, 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 will know, anybody in the Middle East will know that clearly many things, as Daniel Johnson again said, that we take for granted in Europe are most certainly not taken for granted uh, by people in the Middle East or let alone from sub-Saharan Africa where such a large number of the migrants now come from. But we also fib ourselves by trying to change our present. One of the bits of casuistry which a lot of particularly secular thinkers do at the moment is to say after, for instance, a terrorist assault like that in Paris the other week, that the response must be that we abandon all faith schools, for instance. That in response to a terrorist atrocity, we must attack all religion or deracinate a religious identity from the religious square. This is a very perverse way of ignoring a problem. It means that after somebody goes into a theater in Paris uh, with Kalashnikovs and suicide belts, you should shut Anglican state schools in the UK. This makes absolutely no sense. It makes no sense to strip ourselves of our own identity in response to a clear terrorist threat. The other option, of course, is that we give up some of our rights. I was disturbed to hear the references earlier to Charlie Hebdo and the references to these cartoons as abusive and primitive. Abusive and primitive cartoons are something that published every single day in all of the press. I'm sure that your Prime Minister here can tell us something about abusive cartoons. Uh, certainly the Prime Ministers in France, uh, Britain and elsewhere can. Uh, abusive cartoons and abusive speech is protected. It is a right. It is something we can do, partly because such speech is often correct. Uh, but we volunteer to give up a bit of that. We will, for instance, critique all religions bravely, but not Islam. This is a, a very great mistake. And the other thing we do, of course, is that we give excuses to the extremists which they never even asked for. Somebody referred earlier uh, to the risk of a lack of opportunity. Uh, take the Zarneyev brothers, the two, uh, um, uh, the two brothers originally from Dagestan who, uh, um, who went to America with their family 20 years ago. They were given absolutely everything as asylum seekers and as refugees by America. They were given their education, they were given their housing, they were given allowances, they went to university, but they put uh, bombs at the finish line of the Boston Marathon. There was no lack of opportunity, no lack of generosity, no cold-heartedness. It was something quite different. Um, I'm going to wrap up by saying that by the way, um, not a day goes by where you can't also at least have a grim laugh about this. Today, it was provided once again by Saudi Arabia, 
the Saudi Defense Minister, Mohammed bin Salman, uh, this morning announced a 34-country anti-terror coalition that he was helping to put together. And he announced this. It's very unclear what it actually consists of. He announced this by saying, quote, currently every Muslim country is fighting terrorism individually, so coordinating is very important. It, it really does require a heart of stone not to laugh. Um, uh, if the Saudi uh, uh, government wants to find the causes of extremism, it can find them in its own house and palaces. It doesn't need to look around the world for them. So what do we do? Very quickly, five things. The first is, I think, to acknowledge that mass migration of the scale we've seen in recent years has been a great mistake. It has been a historic mistake, and we are still dealing with the consequences of it. A second thing would be to stop the mass migration. That isn't to say stop all immigration, but to stop the mass migration, which is going on at the moment. A third is to acknowledge that the Muslim world is going through a civil war. It's an extremely complex civil war, and it's possible, very likely, it will outlive all of us. But therefore, it's very important that we try to, to, to any extent we can, protect ourselves from it, to shield ourselves from it, and to try to hold it off in order that our own societies do not become completely absorbed by that civil war. We try to absorb, fourthly, those people who are already here, and fifthly, we try, as somebody said earlier, to reconstruct our own societies. After decades of deconstruction from the academies and elsewhere, to reconstruct our societies. And to say we do not have to rewrite our past and our present. We do not have to be made to think impossible things. There are many, many uh, uh, things which we should be thinking about, and many, many good things we have that we would like to keep them, and that there is nothing wrong about saying so. Thank you. Maybe I could answer that, by the, by the way, by saying something maybe I should have said before. It was an extraordinary thing that Chancellor Merkel had to say the other day uh, about the wave of migrants coming into Germany, where she, she had to say that Germany didn't want migrants who are anti-Semitic. Um, it's quite amazing that you wait till this stage to say we don't need more anti-Semites in Germany, a country which has not been unbothered by this phenomenon historically. Um, but uh, the interesting thing about this is, by the way, is that even if you, and it, uh, it comes to your question, even if you take the idea that there is a perfect test which you could do of migrants to make sure that they fitted our liberal um, uh, square peg, as it were, um, the question you raise of second and third generation makes this an infinitely more complex one. Um, by the way, the San Bernardino, the woman who was involved in the massacre at San Bernardino two weeks ago in California had been gone through four checks by Homeland Security, the Department for Homeland Security in the U.S. When, when you get held up by border security in the U.S. and you wonder why, that's why. They did four checks on this woman and they found nothing about her radicalism, despite the fact she had been writing for years on social media that she wanted to carry out such an attack. So it turns out the Department of Homeland Security doesn't have Google. Um, and that points to a far more profound problem, which is that it may be that Chancellor Merkel has the, can develop the most perfect program imaginable to make sure that not one of the million people going into Germany is an anti-Semite, and that they are all liberal, and that they all believe in democracy and free speech, and they don't mind if somebody cartoons their religion, and they will have no views about violence in defense of their religion. It may be. But it may also be that their children have a different view, and that their children's children have another view. And that is the problem that we are all going to confront for the rest of our lives, and our children's children are going to confront for the rest of their lives, because of this stupid historical mistake. Because it may be the case that, as it was in Britain and other countries in Europe, that the first generation came to our countries in order to escape Islamic law, and that then their grandchildren end up perpetuating the idea that Islamic law could solve their problems. The very thing that their ante antecedents fled from becomes the thing they then urge uh, on the country they're in. Uh, and this, this is a problem which is going, there are no simple solutions to it. I have to say, there are no simple solutions to it. It is going to be a security problem, a massive security problem. It is going to be a massive integration problem. We will probably have to accept the fact that large proportions of our societies will not believe in our societies. <laughs> 
That is the result of a policy that Frau Merkel and Sarkozy and many others have created, but we will all have to live with it. And there is no simple solution to it. And they do not have one. They do not have a solution to it. They have given us a problem with no solution. Could I just say a few words too? Um, uh, yes, I agree. Um, in, um, it, it may not be so familiar to Hungarians that uh, actually hundreds of thousands, I think possibly even more than a million Muslims fought in the British armed forces in the Second World War against Hitler and the Japanese. Um, so, uh, you know, it is, and, and as a matter of fact, the first mosque in London, the, what we now call the Regent's Park Mosque, was given to these Muslims as a, a, a sign of gratitude by Winston Churchill, uh, you know, to, to show the appreciation of British people for the contribution they made. So they were super patriotic. They were fighting for a country they didn't even live in. You know, they were, they, these were nearly all in, in India. Um, so it is possible for Muslims to be uh, very patriotic. Um, I would also say that if we listen to the right people, not the wrong so-called moderate Muslims, but I mean, someone like uh, my young friend, Mariam Ahmed, who's a young PhD student at Oxford doing engineering, who was the president of the Conservative Association there, which already, I suppose, makes her rather untypical, but still, she's a third generation young Muslim, uh, and uh, she's written a piece in the next issue of Standpoint, in which she says, why does our government pussyfoot around with dealing with radicalization. Why, for example, don't they just insist that all preachers, all imams in England, should preach in English? So at least we would know what they were saying. Um, why aren't they trained in British universities and colleges? Uh, as, you know, many years ago, Zaki Badawi uh, tried to make happen. You know, he wanted to create a sort of English Islam, like the Church of England. You know, that was his role, his model. Um, it didn't happen, and we're still not doing things like that for fear of offending Muslim communities. Um, so we do have to be a bit more robust about doing quite simple, actually not very controversial things like that, um, but make sure they really are done. 